Welcome to the Texas News Podcast, where we dive into all things Texas politics and the future of independence in the state of Texas. On today's show, we're going to be discussing the campaign shenanigans against Texas First Pledge signers. The establishment is doing everything they possibly can to defeat pro-Texit candidates. Also on today's podcast, we're going to talk to one of those pro-Texit candidates and explore the story of how he was canceled by one of the biggest newspapers in Texas and still landed on his feet. So don't go anywhere. All right, friends. Well, uh, this is going to be a jam-packed one. Uh, not only am I going to get to interview candidate for Senate District 30 race, Cody Clark, who was canceled or attempted can They attempted to cancel him. The Dallas Morning News did when they revoked their endorsement. Uh, we're going to talk to him about that. You know, I've talked about that on the podcast before. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's a it's an interesting story. Cody is is impressive, and I think you guys are really going to like what he has to say. Uh, additionally, I mean, you know, it's always breaking news, right? I mean, you, you've got all kinds of things going on here in election season. But look, I want to I want to jump off really quickly uh, before I get to the news and before I get to the interview with Cody, uh, and, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the TNM's online response core, the orcs, right? Uh, I want to invite every one of you, if you understand in the, the importance of the digital battlefield in our war to get and win a vote on Texas, uh, then we need you. If you're active on social media or uh, comment threads on websites, if you basically know your way around um, social media and, and, and a computer, we need you. And uh, the the importance of this battlefield cannot be overstated. So I would encourage you right now to help us wage the war against misinformation and disinformation uh, by joining the TNM's online response corps. It's easy to sign up. Head over to tnm.me slash orc. That's tnm.me slash O-R-C and sign up today. Uh, you'll get access to our uh, our very special Telegram channel that is our uh, it's our social media war room. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Um, but we need your voice there. We need you to help us amplify our message and combat disinformation, and need you to be a warrior on the digital battlefront. So be sure to go sign up today. All right. Let's get down to brass tacks and let's talk about some of the news. Obviously, uh, big in the news right now here in Texas are the wildfires that are happening in the Panhandle. Devastating wildfires continue to burn in that part of Texas with more than a million acres scorched. That is double the landmass of Houston, now reduced to ash. The Smokehouse Creek Fire is now the largest in state history. Today, we are learning these fires killed an 83 year old woman in Borger and at least 30 homes have already burned to the ground. The fire is expected to continue growing before it is contained. And our hearts go out to every one of, uh, of our Texans that are up there uh, dealing with a, a wildfire that as of yesterday was growing uh, the size of a football field. I think they said every minute or every second. I mean, it's, it's in, insane what's happening up there. People are um, losing their lives, they're losing their their homes, their livelihoods, uh, and we've got supporters up there. Uh, I, it has been encouraging for me to see tex Texas supporters not only uh, participating in but organizing efforts to provide relief to the people up there that are having um, just going through this absolute nightmare scenario. Um, but of course, as you can imagine, the Texas haters and detractors are coming out of the woodwork. Uh, as always happens when Texas has a natural disaster, whether it's hurricanes or the snowpocalypse 2021 or now these wildfires, they, they look for any reason they can to uh, show hate toward Texas. And, and of course, uh, that really is especially true when it comes to the Texas issue. Um, you know, they, uh, the, the comments, and you got to understand, I live down here in in a hurricane zone. I mean, I, I can tell you that 
Uh, since 2005, since the formation uh, of the TNM, I've evacuated multiple times. I mean, I can remember uh, Hurricane Rita in, in 2005. This, this town that I live in here in Nederland looking like the Air Force flew over and carpet bombed the town. So, you know, I'm, I'm really well aware of, of what these natural disasters can do and, and the impacts uh, to the people of Texas. In fact, Hurricane Harvey, which I, you know, I talk about, I mentioned in the in the book, uh, is a benchmark for financial loss for how much we overpay into the federal system. Um, literally, the place where Hurricane Harvey dumped the most rain is about a mile that or two miles that way, right? Um, where I, I sit now was basically an island for about ten days. Um, they not just a block and a half away. Uh, we're launching boats into Port Arthur um, off of the highway. They turned the highway into a into a boat launch. I mean, we we understand here in Texas what the impact of natural disasters are, and and we know that um, the first people to always step up when we have natural disasters are Texans. And they do it uh, quickly. They do it with passion. They do it effectively. And granted people do come in and help. I mean, the Cajun Navy came in from Louisiana and helped with Hurricane Harvey here with uh, high water rescues and things of that nature. But Texans sprung into action. Um, it was not government agencies that did, but the state of Texas uh, prepositioned at prepositions assets when they anticipate there is going to be a, 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 some sort of natural disaster. In fact, one of the strong points of the Texas State Guard is their uh, their relief efforts. You know, it's one of the reasons that one of the many reasons that we have always suggested that the Texas State Guard should be um, expanded and fully militarized and all of those sorts of things as the primary. Um, I guess you would call it foundational element of the Texas military department. Um, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about the Texas state guard, but of course with these wildfires, the opposition wants to come out and they want to attack Texas, right? They, they want to say, Oh, look, you guys will be applying for FEMA money. And they forget over and over and over that number one, FEMA is always a day late and a dollar short. Um, they are about as inefficient as you can possibly get. Um, they, often operate as an impediment to disaster re relief efforts um, and the private sector uh, and the Texas state government handle it far better than FEMA ever did. In fact, um, I think the case could be made that FEMA money is a waste of money because it's first coming out of our pocket going to Washington, D.C., and then being used inefficiently, ineffectively, um, it, it's a joke and, and it always has been. And if you want to know how much of a joke FEMA is, drag yourself down here to Southeast Texas and ask the people that have repeatedly been hit by hurricanes, what their opinion is of FEMA. Now I'm sure you can drag out some, some, you know, maybe some sycophantic individuals that have had a positive experience with, with FEMA. Um, but by and large, uh, by a vast majority of, of Texans that have had to deal with them, uh, they wouldn't scrape FEMA off of the sole of their boots. Uh, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And, and here's what you have to understand. It, it, is, it is ridiculous and degrading that Texas and Texans have to go and ask for money from FEMA when we know that all of those dollars that come in from the federal government started in our pockets in the first place took a 40% haircut before being sent down to, to Texas with tons of strings attached and, and, frankly, in the most inefficient and ineffective ways possible. So, you know, expect to, to see some of that rhetoric ramp up in relation to Texas to the Texas wildfires and panhandle. Expect it, right? But understand that when you see people saying those sorts of things, it, it really isn't about Texas. It's about a fundamental hatred for Texas and its streak of independence. It, it really is. So take it for what it is. Don't be discouraged. You know, it's the same kind of crap they talk about, the you know, the issues with the power grid during Snowpocalypse 2021. They act as though our membership in, in the United States of America somehow makes us immune to natural disasters. And let me tell you something. What we know here in Texas is that's a load of horse hockey. It just ain't true. 
We still get them. We still deal with them. We still pay for them. And the federal government comes in and says, here's some scraps from the master's table. And by the way, if you send any, any relief in privately that we don't like, we'll let it rot in the parking lot of the nearest Walmart. And I say that that is way too specific to be made up because it literally happened right here in Southeast Texas where people sent in ice and FEMA let it sit in the parking lot at Ford Park in Beaumont and melt because they would not allow its distribution unless it went through them. So, yeah, you know, when we talk about FEMA and the federal government having real negative impact, I mean, I I could give you an example after example. I could write an entire book on, on how crappy the federal government is at disaster relief and recovery. And I'm, you know, and I get it, you know, they, they kick some money over to George P. Bush when he's at the general land office and he gets to hand it out for Hurricane Harvey relief and mitigation and all that years after it's all said and done. Biggest joke ever. So when you have the opposition come at you and start spewing this hate, you know exactly where it's coming from and you, and you know what the, what the reality is. And if you don't, truly understand the reality, then you need to go talk to somebody who lives in one of these areas. They get hit by the natural disasters. But in the meantime, there are Texans that are going to be hurting in the panhandle that are going to need your help. And so do everything you can to connect up with any of these relief efforts, uh, these recovery efforts, and, uh, and, and reach out and see what you can do to help. Okay. Um, moving right along. Well, just as we got ready to record, um, this morning, uh, news broke that a federal judge has blocked enforcement of, uh, as they call it on CNN, a controversial Texas immigration law. Yeah, Jackie, some breaking news we're just finding out about within the last hour. A federal judge has blocked Texas's SB4, its uh, state border security law, from taking effect. It was set to go into effect next week. It would have allowed the state of Texas to arrest, jail, and potentially even deport illegal immigrants. But a federal judge has now shot that down, writing in part that essentially states can't conduct their own immigration system. That is up to the federal government. Now we wait to see if the state of Texas appeals. Uh, some of you may remember we've talked about this before the um, Senate Bill Four, which was uh, eventually passed in a special session of the Texas Legislature, uh, essentially allowed Texas to immediately deport anyone that they interdicted illegally crossing the border. And of course, the federal government squealed like a stuck pig. You can't do that. Immigration is our purview which remember, much like FEMA, they do a crappy job of, right? But they said, you can't do that. So obviously they took Texas to court to, uh, to block the, uh, to block enforcement of SB4, just literally right on the cusp of it uh, effectively becoming a law. I mean, we're literally, I think March 1st was, was the day that it was supposed to uh, go into effect. And so, Uh, You have a federal judge in Austin. He ordered the state government Thursday to suspend enforcement of SB4 that would allow state law enforcement agents to arrest and detain people they suspect of entering the country illegally. Now, it is, uh, yet again, another sign, another example of the federal government wanting to control Texas, to basically say, look, we're not going to do the job, but we're also not going to let you do the job. I mean, how how insane is this? But look, you could call it next level insane if you want to, or you could call it that's the status quo. Anyone who thinks that the federal government is going to uh, allow Texas to do the job that we want to do, um, that we frankly need to do, um, is, is delusional, right? The federal courts are not your friend in this matter. Uh, they have repeatedly time and time again. I mean, let's, let's go back to January where they basically punted the issue of the federal government cutting and removing razor wire deployed by Texas on the border. 
right? And and they punted. And, and so now the federal government has carte blanche to go in and cut razor wire and, you know, remove barriers and things like that. And so, you know, I, I, this will obviously be appealed to the Fifth Circuit, right? It will obviously be appealed. As a matter, matter of fact, I think I saw like literally immediately before we started recording that that the appeal has already been filed. So it'll go to the Fifth Circuit and, you know, we're going to run this thing right back up the ladder yet again. But this law was supposed to go into effect. So understand that while all of this is happening, we're still dealing with the status quo. We're still dealing with this massive influx of of illegal immigrants on the border uh, that are coming through in Texas that are overwhelming. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all of it. I, I just, I'm not going to. I'm not going into all of it yet again. If you're a podcast listener, if you have been paying attention in any shape, form, or fashion, you know what's happening. You know how detrimental this is. I mean, th- this is absolute insanity. And here it is, yet again, a federal court rubber stamping this this belief that the federal government can just fail to do what it's literally one of the few things that it's constitutionally required to do. This is a federal court just saying, you know what, whatever. Just you do you do you as long as you don't step on the federal government doing whatever it wants to do. And and look, that's this just goes back to that first line in in uh, Abbott's response to the Department of Homeland Security. The compact between the states and the United States is broken. It's broken. And if you're expecting any relief whatsoever from the federal courts, uh, then you need to quit eating random mushrooms you found on your trail hike. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Uh, I, I can't imagine right now anyone looking at the federal system and saying, A, that it's fixable, or B, that uh, that they have our backs on anything. I just, I, I mean, how could you say that with a straight face? You can't. But yet again, Texas is trying to do the right thing. We're trying to push back on this this nonsense. We're trying to secure our border. We're trying to save Texans twelve and a half billion dollars annually just in state funds. Right? We're we're trying to do the thing that twenty five other states have signed up to support us doing because the federal government is failing miserably. And here it is yet again, a federal institution, a federal judge and a federal court telling Texas that the federal government is supreme and you can't deal with this issue. And we're here to say tough. The only way we're ever going to be secure on our Southern border and have a sensible, sane immigration policy is to become a self-governing independent nation. I will say that over and over and over and over and over until it happens, because it's the truth. You cannot complain about immigration and the border and, and not be a Texas supporter at this point. I mean, how many times does the federal system have to betray you before you get it? So. Obviously, we're going to continue to watch this thing. We're going to see what happens because, um, you know, maybe the Fifth Circuit will be, um, you know, a little bit helpful. But, you know, once you kick it up to the Supreme Court, because, you know, whatever comes out of the Fifth Circuit is going to get appealed one way or the other. This thing is going to run all the way up to the Supreme Court. And let's be honest, it's not like the Supreme Court has been friendly or quick. So we're going to be stuck with the status quo while these bureaucrats do what they do, right? Drag this thing out and then give us an unsatisfactory result at the end of it, okay? All right, uh, moving on to the final thing before I bring on Cody Clark. Uh, Guys, I got to show you this. Uh, If you're watching on the video podcast, uh, the video version, you will see this. Uh, If you're listening to the audio, you won't. But what I'm holding here is literally about... 13 days, maybe, maybe two weeks worth of mailers, uh, for a single solitary race here in Texas. Uh, I, you know, as you can tell by my, my diatribe about FEMA, I live down here in Southeast Texas and I happen to live in house district 21, which is the same house district represented by Dade Phelan, the speaker of the house. And so uh, it has been um, it's been interesting to get a sample uh, of all of these things, <laughs> right? 
Um, but it's it, it's also an interesting uh, case study because obviously we've been talking to other Texas first pledge signers, uh, you know, from state house to schoolhouse is what we like to say. But, it, you know, I say that to say I've been talking to these Texas first candidates um, at, at for the state races, uh, but also down to some of the county races, you know, and and it's interesting. I see. Like here's a a um, a mailer from Alicia Davis. Uh, she is a Texas First pledge signer, uh, paid for by her campaign. Right here's some here's some uh, one for a Republican voter primary guide. Here's one for David Covey's campaign, and then let the flood commence. Here's one for Dade Phelan. Uh, here's another one for Dade Phelan, right? Let's get in here. Here's another one for Dade Phelan. Wow. There's a one from Dan Patrick. Anyway, it goes on and on. I'm not going to, not going to bore you with all this. Um, but I mean, it's, it's insane. The, the level. Now, if you hear the opposition, uh, talk, uh, the, the media, uh, particularly the sort of more establishment folks uh, are spinning this this theory that so much of the like the mailers for like we'll take David Covey here, okay? So much of uh, of the the mailers and and money being spent on these challengers is coming from uh, Tim Dunn and Ferris Wilkes, right? They they will refer to it as the Dunn and Wilkes conspiracy. Uh, where they talk about all these different packs or this one pack that they've set up and how this money funnels through these various organizations. And, and, and they make it sound like this grand conspiracy to obscure where those funds are coming from, right? They make it sound like these two individuals are essentially puppet masters in Texas politics. Now, here's what they don't tell you. What they don't tell you uh, is that really what's happening here uh, is a case of green-eyed jealousy. You see, the political establishment doesn't like competition, and that goes for the people that are funding it. And while they are examining these things with Wilkes and, and Dunn, uh, what they are not doing is taking an eye, uh, taking a, a serious look at, at what ha- is happening and has been happening in Texas politics for quite some time. And that is the involvement of a handful of individuals who have effectively been propping up the political establishment. And I'm not going to get into a a deep dive on this today. Uh, I could, but uh, I'm going to use this as an example, okay? And and really, this discussion came about because of um, some questions asked by some of our local leadership in, in our internal chat. And, and I just took this and, and broke it down for them. So they understood kind of the, the, the magnitude and the gravity uh, uh, and the sliminess that we're dealing with. So I'm going to give you a, a good example here, right? So here is this pack, this mailer that I received. Uh, and, and it says that it is uh, Protect and Serve Texas PAC. Right, and it's a political ad paid for by the Protect and Serve Texas PAC. It says law for big letters, law enforcement professionals of Texas, 2020, 20, uh, excuse me, 2024 state legislature, House District 21 background report. And it says a message from Protect and Serve Texas. And it talks about we seek peace and peace and justice. We value excellent policing and fiscal responsibility to cut crime. We have researched candidates for Texas legislature, and here is what we found. Now, what's interesting about this is on its face, it looks as though these are law enforcement officials, right? These, you know, like, uh, you know, like maybe like a, a peace officers association or something like that. I mean, that's how it looks. I mean, it literally says law enforcement professionals of Texas. Now, what it doesn't say is, we are law enforcement professionals of Texas. It just says those words, right? But it, it's clear that they're trying to give the impression that somehow this pack is related to law enforcement and maybe run by them. And so on the back, on the back, it says legislative candidates, background check report, 
And it says, below are the results of criminal and other background checks of three candidates for Texas state legislature in the March Republican primary. This election is important. Please read and make your own decision. And so they says, Dade Phelan endorsed background report. Unlike many politicians in this day and time, Dade Phelan has a clean record. And then it goes on to give these long, horrible allegations against David Covey and against Alicia Davis, uh, which are just absolutely, I mean, insane. They're accusing Covey of pretending to be an attorney, lying about his marital status, which is a lie. I mean, he, he, I ha- look, I, I've known David for, for many, many years uh, and met his wife when they were pretty freshly married. Um, you know, I mean, this, this idea of being, of lying about his marital status is just another slam, right? But then they get to Alicia Davis, right? And they talk about, um, you know, she has paid thousands of dollars in penalties to cover her delinquent behavior, making late tax payments. No, what, what's happening here is that Alicia is struggling like every other Texan with the most, one of the most immoral taxes that you could possibly have. And that's property taxes. No one should have to pay rent to own their property, right? You don't own it if you're paying rent to keep it. But here we go. Like Covey, Davis signed a pledge to, if elected, do everything possible to remove Texas from the United States. On this group's website, notice they don't mention us, they offer to support signers by running negative ads on their opponents and pushing their campaigns in the news media and online. She signed the Texas First Pledge, just like David Covey did. Now, what's interesting about this is this this idea about signing the Texas First Pledge and not mentioning us actually pops up in some other mailers, not from this pack. In fact, it's something that Lynn Stuckey had sent over to uh, to d- did on a mailer against uh, against Andy Hopper twice this cycle and once last cycle. It's a position that he since abandoned because I suspect that it doesn't get him any traction. In fact, we saw we saw uh, the incumbent opponent of Christina Drury in Smith County for Smith County Commissioner try to attack Christina Ford and sent out a mailer about the pledge and the fact that Christina is a uh, district director in the TNM and Christina literally talks about how the mailer went out and a constituent, she's out working the polls during early voting and, and someone came out to vote and said, Hey, I saw that mailer about you, uh, you know, uh, about Texas and the TNM, and uh, and we're here to vote for you. Right. So it, it is indeed backfiring, but that's not the point here. You, you see this, this hatred being spewed out in Biederman's race and Hopper's race and Christina's race and this, this, uh, feeling race down here and, and all, you know, Wes Verdell. I mean, these are people that have been, uh, endorsed by Donald Trump and by uh, Governor Abbott and Ken Paxton and Lieutenant Go- I mean, you know, I'm not saying that all have been endorsed by those people, but I mean, that's where you're seeing these these things line up, these endorsements. And so you have to ask yourself, well, what in the world is going on here with this Protect and Serve Texas PAC? Well, what you find out is that when you start looking at this PAC, first and foremost, their website has almost nothing on it. Uh, but when you start looking at campaign finance reports, understand that everything in Texas politics is about following the money where the establishment is, con- is concerned. In fact, what you find is that there are a handful of individuals with names like, um, oh, I don't know, Now and Weekly and Perot, uh, you know, that are very wealthy individuals that are pumping money into all of these various packs and shifting money between the packs to go out there and do these, these hate mailers. I mean, that's just what they do. They, they, whether it's TV ads or these mailers or whatever it is. And so I I would ask you, if you look at these mailers, because it's the easiest to tell there, but if you look at a lot of these mailers, what you're going to find uh, is from different packs, right? Like protect and serve Texas pack or Texans for lawsuit reform, which, you know, we could have a whole conversation about them and, and the shadowy influence that they've had, um, you know, or, you know, any number of these other packs. I mean, there's one that is masquerading as a Houston 
business owners pack. They come up with all these different names to make it seem like they're from different uh, special interests, right? They, they have different uh, affinities, right? Whether it's, you know, the border or education or whatever, and they come up and they create these packs. And then what they will do is they will fund money into some of the, some of the packs. Then some of those packs will swap money between one another. And essentially what they're doing is they are giving the impression that their viewpoint is, is shared by all of these different special interest groups. And so it's all designed to give the impression that there's this broad base of support. But I would argue that for many years, the influence of, of now and weekly and Perot and, and, and a few of these others has been far greater than that of Dunn and Wilkes. I mean, they are alleging this grand conspiracy um, between, you know, from these two guys to basically take over Texas politics, but they have ignored the main story. They buried the lead. The, the big story is that's the way that it's been for a long time with now and weekly and Perot and some of these other guys where they t- spend buku bucks on these shadowy packs to go out there and attack anyone who challenges their power and authority. You know, I, I would suggest that perhaps they kick over some of those rocks and follow some of that money. And when they do, what you're going to find is that this is, number one, it's not a conspiracy theory. It is a conspiracy fact. But it really and truly is in indeed the political machine at work here in Texas. If you want to expose the soft white underbelly of the political establishment, all you got to do is go pull campaign finance reports for the te- for Texans for lawsuit reform, protect and serve Texas PAC, and you start tugging on those threads and it will take you down some pretty interesting, into some interesting places. You will see beyond a shadow of a doubt who is indeed engaged in a conspiracy to control Texas. And so I go back to what I said. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that while mainstream media and the political establishment is painting this, this conspiracy theory about uh, Dunn and Wilkes, it really is about green-eyed jealousy. Uh, they don't want someone else doing what they're already doing. Uh, you know, just because someone goes out there and replicates their machine gives them, gives them pause. They're, they're basically saying, look, we'll, we'll do the same thing to you that you've been doing to us for, for years and years and years now. Turnabout, my friends, is indeed fair play. So, uh, look, um, by the time this podcast drops, uh, we will be, uh, either, I think we'll, I'm not sure if we're, we're exactly when we're going to be dropping, but you know, look, we've got the primaries coming up March the 5th. And if you haven't voted already, you need to go do it. You need to go dig up that Texas first pledge signer, um, printout that we email out to everyone, uh, or go to take Texas and go look for those people on your ballot and do your thing. You know, whatever that, whatever that thing is, go do that thing. Uh, because the only way this ever changes is when you have uh, an, uh, this this political uh, ballot uprising by the people. And it's happening right now. Uh, the amount of money being spent in these races, I, I suspect for what they would consider, an, uh, you know, we're in a, in a presidential election year, but we don't have any of the statewide candidates on the ballot, um, I suspect this this could be historic spending levels for a primary. Uh, I'm just I'm guessing. I talked to uh, I talked to Biederman the other day, uh, Kyle Biederman, and uh, you know he he reminded me that in his race when he first ran that the incumbent spent over two million dollars to try to beat him, but yet Biederman still won. So money is not the only thing that matters. But it's an important thing. But it's also important to understand that the people, uh, who the people are that are spending the money to keep you subservient, they're keeping you under the thumb of a federal government that would essentially say, 
no, sorry, you can't protect your own border. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's get to get to Cody. He's been, he's been waiting long enough. So, uh, many of you know, from a previous podcast, uh, and if you read TNM news that, uh, Cody Clark is a candidate for Senate district 30. He's running for a Senate seat vacated by state Senator Drew Springer, who announced that he was not running again. Uh, and, uh, there, there was a, a tremendous amount of drama, uh, about what happened with Cody. Uh, that is a, essentially a four person race, uh, for that open seat, there's issues of one of the candidates' residency, and then there is this issue with Cody, who received an endorsement from the Dallas Morning News, and the Dallas Morning News revoked it, and that had a bunch of spillover. Uh, and so, uh, you know, why write about it when you can talk to the man about it himself? And so, I, I would, uh, I just like to take the opportunity right now to welcome. Cody Clark to the Texas News Podcast. Well, Cody, look, I, I have uh, I have really been looking forward to this interview, and uh, I just really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. I know campaign season is is kind of crazy. So before you know, we've talked about you on the podcast before, uh, but uh, let, let's let's hear it from your words. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about about who you are and, and why you're running? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on, Daniel. Um, the the biggest thing is. Uh, that we like to pitch is we do in function what you would hope your legislative official is doing as their job, which is working on substantive legislative matters for Texans. So now professionally, I'm a police officer by trade. What I do now, though, we start a small business. We take care of people with special needs. That's your autism, your Down syndrome. We take care of where they live in our communities and also meet their medical and therapeutic needs. So anything you might need in your life or I might need in mine, we do on the behalf of those individuals. Just over a decade of time, as our business has grown, I no longer work in our brick and mortar business every day. What I do is work on the larger big ticket issues for the greater IDD and special needs community. And necessarily, that means I work with our legislative officials, like the outgoing Senator Springer, which is the senator for the district I'm running in, Senate District 30. But not only him locally, but with all of our legislative officials down at the Capitol itself. So, while many of uh, the other candidates in our race do other things and then are trying to be uh, uh, your elected official and do legislative measures, the only thing I actually work on are legislative initiatives for Texans. And that's really the difference we bring to the race. Right. Well, t tell us, you know, what was it that, that really motivated you to say, look, you know, SD, SD30 um, needs, needs my voice? What, what was your prime motivation for running for office? Well, uh, our prime motivation really is it's the next step of the work that we do every day. So in our business, like I described a moment ago, we work with these individuals and they're underserved in Texas. Texas is the worst funded state for people with IDD and special needs. Every once in a while, Mississippi beats us out, but almost every year, we're actually the worst in the nation. And I don't find it to be a conservative value to take care of the least of us, people People who our government should be helping, those that cannot take care of themselves, at the lowest levels in the country. So after doing this for a, approaching a decade uh, professionally, um, we just started advocating on their behalf. Uh, started with phone calls, then emails, then showing up, then testifying, then um, testifying to all the committees and providing information on the industry and bringing our clients down and their caretakers. And so it was just a progression, a natural progression of trying to serve vulnerable Texans that really got us into the mix. And we were working with our legislative official, Drew Springer, and his office down there, the office, this last legislative session, of course, came back pretty de dejected from the 88th session and all the subsequent special sessions. I mean, we were down there for the conference committees. You know, I was down there for two weeks straight at one point. Um, I came back dejected, and so we're looking for okay, because I don't, I'm not one who believes in stupidity, which is doing the same thing over and over and then expecting a different result. We always try to attack things at a different angle, you know, not dissimilar from some of the things that you guys are doing. And so we begged, we pleaded. I've gotten down on one knee. I've asked. I provided information. You know, we've gone and testified to all the relevant people, and uh, our senators decided not to run for re-election. So we thought begrudgingly, quite honestly, well, who better? You know, we're already doing what your legislative official should be thinking about, hopefully actually implementing in function. 
Um, we even find out ways to save and give actionable plans on saving all of us Texans hundreds of millions of dollars annually uh, to provide additional services, or they could go to pay down property taxes and eliminate those or mental health issues. All of those things that they should be doing, we, we do for a segment of our population. So it just really made a lot of sense to go, well, we've done all the other inroads to try to get this accomplished for the people we serve. Let's do this next step. And so it was just a natural progression, not an intentional, oh, I need to, I'm the one that needs to be our politician. I actually take this on with a great deal of humility. Um, I don't take myself particularly seriously. I just take the work that we do incredibly seriously. And so this is the natural progression. So look, I mean, look, your, your motivations for running, I mean, you know, and I heard you, you mention just how dejected you came out of the 88th. I mean, I think, um, I, I don't think anyone left out of this legislative session or the special sessions feeling good about anything, um, that, that happened. You know, I think people were, were definitely feeling, uh, like someone took the jam out of their donut. Um, but let's, let's get to, um, you know, you, you decide to run, right? You, you say, look, I, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. Uh, I'm going to run for the seat because, uh, for those who don't know, Drew Springer announced that he was not going to run for reelection. Um, so you're basically looking at an open Senate seat and that race has been, it's been, been pretty dramatic, right? Why don't you give folks a, a little bit of a kind of a, an overview of, of some of what's happened in that race, but not the Dallas Morning News. We'll, we'll get to that here in a moment. But but really, some of the other drama that's been going on. Yeah, it's um, it, it's been interesting. You know, um, I, I think it is kind of a wild jump to come out of nowhere. We're we're not pr- particularly politically connected. Um, we were doing what I like to say is we we were doing the politicking of your legislative official, but we were doing the work that your legislative official should be doing. And so when it came into, oh, well, now you got to do some of the politics and you got to go to the galas, you got to go to the the cocktail parties, the after hours things, you know, we started doing those things. And after entering the, ra- entering the race, we started just having people approach us and be like, hey, you know, uh, you know, the uh, the former Denton County GOP chairman, uh, Brent Hagaboo, you know, he doesn't live in the district, right? And I said, no, because that's like literal question two on the application form is what's your permanent resident address? Well, I would assume that all of our addresses would be in the district, you know, and I know that doesn't necessarily apply to some congressional races, but a state level race, it's absolutely critical. It's in our state constitution as well as our Texas election code. And so it just started off with that. And that, um, that has unfortunately cast a shadow and really muddied the water in our entire election uh, here locally. So um, for this entire time, we've been fighting against that and arguing against that. I filed an appeal through the State Republican Party of Texas, which um, I know y'all are at uh, odds with a little bit. Um, They did not do their job in our case. They have the right to reject a candidate's application on its face, and I'm not aware of many cases. I know if someone applied at our business or maybe applied uh, with you guys, and they lied on a fundamental piece of information on their application, you'd shred that right in front of their face and call it a day. Well, that's not what our state Republican Party sees their job to do, even though they are able to do that. So we've challenged it. Uh, The other candidates challenged it in court. I didn't join on that and uh, joined them because they were already doing it. Uh, One part was challenged to try to get the Republican Party of Texas to do what they're supposed to do. Um, The state said, uh, the court said they... Well, they could do it, but there's nothing um, that forces them to do their job. And then the other one is still hang up in the court. It's it's literally waiting to be placed on the docket for trial. And we're going to determine this candidate's eligibility. And so, and just to make that very clear, it's really not a question of what has occurred. The guy is ineligible to hold office. The only real question we have is, is the state of Texas, is our court system are they going to allow it to not matter? And so I'm hoping that they will not set a new precedent. This is not your typical residency requirement for Brent Hagaboo. It is fundamentally different in that he never resided in the district um, at any point, didn't own property there or anything before the statutorily required timeline 
And uh, unfortunately, I just believe that we got to follow rules, you know. Um, so he's going to have to explain why he doesn't have to follow the rules in court. He's going to have to probably be deposed and swear to that. And I don't find that that's going to work out for him. And unfortunately, that's bad for all of the constituents to send to District 30, all the voters, all the endorsements that he's gotten. And it's going to uh, leave, leave a lot of egg on people's faces, unfortunately. Um, but that's kind of the state of our deal. Um, I think, unfortunately, politics is politicking in our race. It's not, um, it's not really uh, the best outcome for the constituents. And that's what they need. They, we need a conservative Senate District 30 candidate uh, that's going to be in office and lead from that conservative position and what right now the, the preferred nominee of the establishment, the slimy Republican establishment, is a liar. So, Yeah, and, and I mean, and I think you're, you're definitely seeing it firsthand. I mean, you, you've spent time at the Capitol, and, and I can tell you, you know, my first foray um, on a policy issue to the Capitol uh, was back in, in 2009. It's the first time I ever testified in front of a committee. And, and you go in with this set of, you know, just kind of the you, uh, the way that things are, right? I mean, you, you kind of have this, I'm not going to say rose-colored glasses or, or Pollyanna view, but, <laughs> but you do have a, yeah. a pretty optimistic view of of the way things should work. And you know what that is. That is, that is way too much thinking that, people are Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Right. Right. Um, but you know, when you get into the, the campaigning aspect of this, you get to uncover a whole different side of, uh, of how the political machine runs. And, you know, and I encourage people all the time, Cody, um, if you want to understand Texas politics, you got to run for office because that's, oh, man. I mean, and, and you're, I mean, you're out there seeing it firsthand that it is a definite gap between this political establishment that would rather have a selection than an election, uh, and, and the people who just want representation, you know, they just, they want somebody who actually gives a damn. I mean, that's really what they want. Frankly. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, you know, right now it feels like, you know, um, you know, the Fonz trying to jump a motorcycle over the Grand Canyon right to right. close that gulf between the people <laughs> and the political establishment hey did you did you ever think that the fonds would come up in this interview no i didn't uh it was a good segue <laughs> though i like it yeah i mean it, well, it's absolutely disgusting if you're a person of character and integrity which i pride myself on being um just in general but also just solidified through my for my uh almost two decades in law enforcement as well um being in politics, running for office will absolutely turn you off from that. You know, I've had serious conversations with myself, with my wife about going, if this is how it has to be, I just can't be a part of that. And what we ultimately came out of the decision is, is, well, if nobody is like we are and they're not getting at least some of us into office, we can't ever change that. So um, despite being turned off on the politicking, uh, the politics of politicking and campaigning, um, we just decided that it, you know, it's the righteous thing to do. You know, we are the right, right kind of people to run. Uh, we're normal people, commonsensical, rational, logical people. Uh, we're doing it on the behalf of others who cannot do it, so we're doing it for the right reasons. If if we're if we're going to be turned off from doing this kind of work. Well, then nobody is going to do it. And then we're going to be left with what we got. And you think you see that manifest in our institutions, whether here at the state level or at the congressional level. You know, it's um, we need more people, more good people to do these kind of things. So we're not going to run away from it. We're just going to embrace it. It may be what it is. And that may, may be to the detriment of our campaign. But that does not change what we are going to do. We're going to operate with integrity and character. And we're going to be an example to others and hopefully that they enjoy uh, with us and also maybe inspire a couple other people to do the same thing. Because that's what we need to bring around. You know, if there's not a fundamental there level of character and integrity of your elected official, um, they are ineligible to hold office, in my opinion. And we have to start from that foundation. Right. Well, you know, it's, uh, you know, to paraphrase Sam Houston, you know, do, do what's right and risk the consequences. Right. You got to do the right thing. No matter they got to do oh, what they're going to do what they're going to do. We got to do the right thing. 
right? That's right. So, well, look, speaking of, let, let's let's tear off into this because I know our, our time today is, is a bit limited. But, sure. um, you know, any, any of the listeners of the podcast know, uh, and anyone who reads the news section on the TNM website or follows on social media uh, has very likely uh, heard or seen uh, the drama about uh, the endorsement and the withdrawal of the endorsement by the Dallas Morning News. So uh, for those of you that are playing catch up, I would normally just say, go listen to the other version, right? Go, go listen to the previous episode or go to the website, but, but just the high points, Cody uh, did something that, that very rarely happens to Republican and conservative candidates in, in that he got an endorsement from the editorial board of the Dallas Morning News. Now, this is the board that that famously, um, when I ran for lieutenant governor two years ago, um, absolutely had their minds blown and wouldn't touch us with a ten foot pole. Wouldn't touch any candidate in the race, um, and so it, it was it was a, a bit of a surprise, you know, that the editorial board would look at at Cody, the the entirety of of his character, why he he was running. Uh, and, and then and then endorse him because it's it's a rare thing. I mean, it's like a it's like a Sasquatch riding a unicorn uh, down Main Street, you know that kind of deal. Uh, and so yeah. it, it was. I mean, I think it was a testament. But then, well, well, before we before we get to what happened next, what what was your initial reaction when you got the the endorsement from the Dallas Morning News? Well, it was kind of, it's kind of wild, you know. Um, so I had an interview with him, uh, a very short interview. It was not a uh, comprehensive at all. Um, and actually just as happenstance would with all the conflicting interests of the campaign, I just missed it on my calendar. I literally looked at the wrong calendar day and said, Oh, I don't have that today. That's tomorrow. Nope. That was today. So I missed their formal interview. I was able to reach out to them and they called me and I had about a 10 minute conversation with just one of the guys on the editorial board. Now, his name escapes me at the moment. And it was a great ca- conversation. You know, it is unusual. I think we're in a we're a different kind of candidate. I mean, what, what we do in function is, how do I be a conservative Republican, yet what I have to effectively do is I run a welfare program for the state of Texas. I've been big government. I've been the police officer, you know. So how does that kind of align with conservative principles? And we laid that out. Well, it's the type of work that our government should do for the right kind of people, which are people that cannot do for themselves. And then what do we do as a result? One, we exist to save you, me, and every taxpayer in the state of Texas, not to the tune of millions of dollars, but billions of dollars because the state is so terrible with everything. So they contract with provider and private business owners like ourselves to do this more efficiently and effectively. So the... I think that's the reason why I kind of resonated with them. They're like, oh, you're a conservative Republican, yet you're you're working on social issues. You're finding ways to save money, uh, get more services. And I think it was that part that really resonated with them. Um, now, uh, I was actually not aware of the endorsement um, until they called me back and retracted it. So they didn't even <laughs> let me know about it, even though they endorsed me, um, which I wow. would have loved to promote promoted because I thought that was a pipe dream, kind of like what you were kind of articulating, right. which is there is no chance on this earth that I'm getting endorsement from a major newspaper, especially the Dallas Morning News. And in fact, I got one. And then they called me back to let me know about it. And I'm like, wait, are you saying you did endorse me? And they're like, well, we did, <laughs> but we have to take it back because of your affiliation with Texas. And I'm like, do what? <laughs> so that's when I learned of it is when they took it back. Right. Well, let's let's talk about that, because, you know, for for those out there, you know, I, I mentioned in the intro, uh, Cody is a, a signer of the Texas First Pledge. Um, mm-hmm. And, and in, anyone who knows what we've talked about knows that it is not an explicit declaration that they're in favor of Texas. It's it's a declaration no. that says, look, I believe in Article one, Section two of the Texas Constitution. I believe that this is a question that should be put to the people of Texas. I mean, it's simple as that. 100%. Now. You know, I I mean, I I think we could have an entire conversation about the irony of newspaper editorial board members who uh, lack basic reading comprehension. Um, But rather rather than dwell on their illiteracy, um, let's talk about what happened. Right. So they called you up. They revoked the endorsement. 
and and it seems like the, the the attitude was that well we'll just you know we'll basically just grind him to powder and he'll just capitulate and he'll run out. It's very similar to what happened two years ago with uh, with David Shank, who's running uh, for right. I think he's running court of criminal appeals or whatever. That's um, right. He is. So, yeah. but but that's that's not what you did. You you didn't you no. didn't rescind your pledge. Why, why don't you let folks know? Um, kind of, kind of your thought process behind that. Sure. Well, the thought process behind it is, uh, I'm a rational, logical, commonsensical person. I can read and comprehend. So that, that's really the real, really the gist of it. But, you know, I'm a, a proud signer of the Texas first pledge. Um, it does not bother me in the least to say that Texans, our constituents, we, the people should be the ultimate people. Uh, ultimate ones who determine our fate of our government and direct our elected officials to do how they should do their job. Um, that That is the job, okay? And and so what I did is uh, someone, uh, one of my constituents referred it to me, actually a precinct chair said, hey, what's your feeling on uh, the Texas First Pledge in Texas? And I said, well, uh, obviously I've heard about it. Uh, I don't know my feeling about it. And what I did right. is I literally just clicked on the link and I read all the tenets of the pledge and I thought, that sounds entirely agreeable. So I'm for Texans deciding their fate on any issue, making their voices heard. If they meet the standards to get on the ballot and put it to a vote, I'm totally for that. And whatever the outcome of that is, if there's this overwhelming support for any issue, whether it be gambling, whether it be abortion rights, whether it be Texas, whatever the issue is, then we take that back to our constituents of Senate District 30 and say, hey, Texans thought this was important. They thought specifically that we should do something about this. Here's the results of that. Here's the issue as, I'm, as we understand it. And let's take it to the people and talk about it and see if it is something that not just Texans in general, but the people of Senate District 30 want to have implemented and if that's their will that is your job as an elected official or step down and don't do it it's that straightforward right. so when when confronted with uh one you're a seditionist i'm like no nah, that's not the case <laughs> i want to i want people to voice their uh voice their will and direct their own government like we're supposed to do um and then they're like well are you going to retract that i'm like no no i'm not going to retract that at all and we'll just let it lay where it lays. And what I've found to be the result is it's got to be one naysayer to a hundred people uh, in the positive on that idea. So um, I'm more than happy to support it. I don't think it has damaged me uh, anywhere politically. In fact, I think it, it made me better off than before. And it just seems wild to me that I would have to have a discussion really with anybody uh, that would say, Doing what your constituents want you to do, or at least at minimum, being open to hearing their voice on any issue, mm -hmm. is not what you should be doing. That is ludicrous. Right. Well, let, so let, let me ask you. I mean, I think I think this is. Look, I have I have my my opinion on this, but I, I would be interested to hear hear yours. What is? Why do you think the political establishment is so so averse? to hearing from Texans on the Texas issue. Why do you think they're scared to put it on the ballot? I don't know. You know, um, I think with anything, you know, when you have some kind of big, you know, political machine, uh, machine of any kind, uh, it could be a business machine. It could be governmental machine, whatever. There's always resistance anyway. And this is changing yeah. the status quo. It's redefining our relationship with our government and how they operate and what they do for Texans. And so I think there's going to be a natural level of pushback on that regardless. Um, but, you know, I think what it does is there, what I think it does, it always comes down to money. It affects yeah. their pocketbook. It affects how they stay in power. It affects maybe where they see their political future going. And, and so when you're doing that, you're upsetting their plans and their aspirations and the money that flows into their campaigns. And so I think that that is probably what you're, what you're encountering and what we're encountering. Um, I think 
that if you had a one-on-one, -on -one, just an individual conversation with anybody and said, shouldn't we listen to the people? Shouldn't we do the will of the people? Isn't that yeah. what you would expect your elected official to do? I would think everyone would say yes on an individual level, but we're not talking about an individual level. We're talking about some greater political machine. We're talking about people's mm -hmm. livelihoods and funding and the money that they they do their parties with, and then they, they sprinkle back over the representatives to control them and control their votes. So um, it, I think that's really why, is we're upsetting the status quo, and uh, they're pushing back against that. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it, if you, you listen to the opposition arguments, right, they, they love to say that no one really wants Texas to be independent. Um, and you would think that if that was indeed the case, then they would just put it on a ballot and and let it go yeah. down in flames and That's shut right. the shut the entire discussion down. But they right. they seem to be pretty resistant to letting the people of Texas speak on this issue. So very, I hundred percent agree. If you're not worried about it, if yeah. you think it's a non-issue, okay, you got the amount of ballot signature or signatures required to put on the ballot. Put the dang thing on the ballot. Let's see what they say. They don't want to do that. Yeah, though. It's, they don't. And, you know, I'm 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 excited for the next legislative session uh, when we can get the Texas Independence Referendum Act filed for the third time. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll see some substantive changes in, in both the House and Senate. And uh, we would love to work with Senator Cody Clark on this issue. So um, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, man, uh, let me just go ahead and say this is because I know we've got to wrap up. But yes, um, your response to the the Dallas Morning News folks uh, and, and really some of those naysayers that came out of the woodwork uh, was a testament to your character. Uh, right. 100%. Thank you. And, um, you know, this is exactly what we need in uh, elected offices here in Texas. We've got to have people of character that are not going to back down when the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the woke mob or the propagandist masquerading as media uh, co right. come at us because of a position they don't like. You know, they're agenda-driven right. attacks. And, and so... Um, Kudos to you, man. I mean, it it really it really means a lot to see people yeah. of integrity uh, running for office, and and I'm just I'm Thank very you. excited for you, Cody. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. You know, I don't know where our road's going to take us. You know, um, but what we always wanted to do above everything else, it's important to me, is, is to run a campaign of character and integrity. You know, um, mm. I don't sacrifice that for for anybody, for any concept, for any amount of money. You know, we don't take donations in our campaign for that exact reason. Nobody will exert influence over me. Only we, the people, only our constituents. They're the only ones I'm beholden to. So we wanted to exude that and just have that in spades. So nobody's going to be able to question us on our on our motives. It's because it's the right thing to do. That's why we do things. And um, regardless of the outcome, we wanted to always be able to say, you know what? We did it the right way, the way that it should be done. And, and we can lay it all out on the field and wherever that ends us up, I'm actually good with. I'm not, I'm not a, I don't have a problem with any outcome. But um, we're going to keep down, going down the road. We're going to keep serving people regardless. Um, you know, I, I hope to have a fantastic relationship. If it's not me that is our next Texas State Senator for SD30, uh, I want to have a fantastic relationship with the guy, that, guy or gal that is. Um, it is important for Texans, specifically the ones we serve, to have that good relationship and you know the work that we're doing is beneficial for texans across the state you know whether it comes to saving money or providing more services or or just having that really depth of knowledge in our specific industry that really is lacking from our texas legislature um, we need to find conservative ways to win on the issues that we're bringing to the table and we're trying to provide that for for our legislators or do that ourselves as our senator well, fantastic. Well, Cody, hey, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Yes, uh, and thank you for being a person of integrity out there contending uh, for you. the principles which make Texas, Texas. You think it'd be easy to do that, but, you know, it seems like it's a problem for some people. But uh, I appreciate more than anything, your audience. I appreciate your time having me on. If there's anything else I can never do for you, feel free to reach out. Uh, if anyone has any questions about the interview, wants to contact us, you know, our information on there my personal phone number and it, it's not by a staffer it's actually me 
If you message me, it goes to me. You get a response back from me. It's all on our website, and that's uh, Clark Four. That's F O R Office dot com. It's got all our contact on there. Appreciate y'all. Fantastic. Thank you, Cody. Okay, friends. Well, uh, that was Cody Cody Clark, and I want to thank him again for um, being a, a, a man of integrity for being a person who sticks to his guns. When he makes a pledge, he sticks to it. Can't, they can't be said for everyone, right? Uh, but when when challenged to compromise his integrity, uh, Cody Clark told them to pound sand. And for that, we're very appreciative. That is a truly Texan attitude right there. I mean, it just doesn't get more Texan than that. Okay, friends, that is a wrap for the Texas News Podcast. I uh, want to thank you guys so much for joining us week in and week out. Be sure to uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all the cool things wherever you're seeing this, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find this thing. Do all the good things. Um, but also share this podcast with other people. This is the important way that we get uh, we get the message out to folks. Uh, if you believe that what you're hearing here hearing on here is valuable, uh, then absolutely 100%, the best thing you can do is share it. Now, the second best thing you can do, really it's kind of the best thing, but the second best thing is if you support the work that we're doing here at the TNM, like this podcast and like all of the uh, the news and educational materials and you know the fact that we're active in every corner of the state and that we're advancing the cause of Texas more than it has been advanced in, in history, uh, then you, you've got to become a member, right? You've got to take the opportunity right now and go to tnm.me slash join and become a member, right? You can get, join up as little as $4.21 a month. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's set so it can be affordable, but your membership helps us keep the fight going. I mean, look, this gets expensive and, and, you know, we have to get out there and do the things necessary to get and win a referendum on Texas independence. And, um, it, it's only you that, that makes it happen. It's you that makes this podcast happen. It's you that keeps the website running. It's you that keeps our groups in the field. It's you that makes sure that we're in the media all the time. And Lord knows right now we are everywhere. I mean, Newsweek is dropping an article about us on average, on average of uh, one a day. I mean, it feels like, but I mean, it, it's everywhere. And so for us to continue to, to mount the political pressure necessary, to make Texas Day reality, it's going to take your uh, membership to do that. So head over to tnm.me, join, and join today. All right. Uh, I will leave you this week with the words I leave you with every single time we're together. They're the words of Sam Houston when he said that Texas will again lift its head and stand among the nations. I believe that time is now, and the question is, will you stand with her? <laughs>